everybody. Um, as Dave mentioned, we are uh, quite spread out internationally, and I think uh, that's uh, that's super cool. Uh, super cool session we have uh, planned for today. Uh, so to give you an idea of uh, what what my background is. Um, I'm coming from a business background, um, but I've spent the last 15 years uh, in data management, being a BI consultant, data management consultant, um, basically a data engineer. Um, so I, I know a lot about the struggle of how you do like data engineering in a manual way uh, and why it takes so much time and why it can be frustrating as well. So when I learned about Time Extender, one year ago, uh, not only did they give me the chance to relocate to the Canaries, uh, which was uh, one of my dreams, um, but also they have this amazing product, uh, which I will show you, you today, um, that will enable you in your data engineering journey and your data engineering needs um, to be so much faster and so much more efficient. Um, that when I was presented with the topic for today, raw to curated data in under 90 minutes, I was thinking to myself, well, it may be a challenge, but uh, I think we can do even better than that. So let's say raw to curated data in under 60 minutes, and I would even go if we take it slow, right? So I think we can do much more than this in uh, in 90 minutes. And this is why today we have a two-part presentation. Basically, we will take data from raw to curated, and I will take you all the way um, of how you do that. But also I will show you um, from a practical perspective um, in terms of advanced analytics, in terms of data science tooling, how you can then use what we create, raw and curated data um, to make it work together with the tooling that you know and uh, use every day. So we, we have an imaginary company, maybe you, you recognize the pictures. Uh, the company is Rainholm Industry, and obviously Dan uh, is the CEO here. Then we have uh, Jen, who is a middle manager, and uh, she's basically there to make sure Dan is happy, but also that uh, Roy and Mo Morris are happy. Um, Roy is the IT guy at the company, and he became a data engineer basically against Will. But at some point, he was the most a tech savvy person in the room. And so he just started to work with the data, which is actually my story uh, and how, how it turned out. Uh, and Morris, on the other hand, is like the, the creative guy, the data science guy. Uh, he wants to have um, all data available at all times to run his crazy experiments, but also to perform the ad hoc analysis that Dan and Jen are asking of him. Right. And I, I think that's that's very typical that if you look at a company and at a like a data situation that you have um, different groups of people who are asking and needing different things um, from the data. Of course, you have the business users. They want reports and dashboards on reliable and curated data that should be up to date and uh, mostly reliable. Um, but they also request ad hoc analysis that is um, to be created upon their request so they can make uh, well business decisions because in the end all of data management is no um it's not the end goal but it is there to to serve the business right then we have the data engineers of course they spend a lot of time to connect integrate clean prep and transform the data to ultimately provide curated data for these dashboards and reports and uh, let's say the third group are the data scientists who are trying to develop and run the experiments to discover patterns, but also to perform maybe ad hoc uh, analysis. You, you know very well, uh, probably all of you, uh, these three groups and how they have like um, goals and questions that do have some overlap, but that are not exactly the same, obviously. And also between the engineers and the data scientists, typically the tool set um, can be very, distinct from another. So what we will do in this in this demo today, in our session today, we will take data and we will bring it to what we call the operational data exchange. Uh, Technology-wise, this is Azure Data Lake Generation 2. So you can call this the staging area. You can call this 
the landing zone, you can call it zone zero, bronze layer, uh, staging uh, database, what, whatever you want to call it. But that is what it is. It is where the data gets ingested from the data sources, decoupled from the sources, raw data basically, um, to, to have it available for analysis without putting pressure on the source system at all times. Then the second step is the data warehouse. Uh, we will be looking at an Azure SQL database in our particular case. The data warehouse is where you consume the data to from the data lake, from the operational data exchange. This way, you take it in, you make it behave, you shape it, you clean it, you transform it, you denormalize it, you model it, uh, all of that uh, good stuff. And then lastly, um, we will take the data as well to Power BI so that the business users have their curated and up-to-date dashboards um, every day. And this is where um, Dan and Jen will be looking at most of the time. In this case, we will be using Power BI Premium. But we also want to look at it from Morris' perspective. And in this case, I have prepared as a part two of the, of the session today, um, a Databricks workspace that we will use to then make use of all the effort that has been put into the data engineering, both on the lake and in the warehouse, to get the best of both worlds and use it and combine the data um, yeah, in a data science uh, tooling in a Databricks environment. Basically, we are using Apache Spark to read both types of data and to, um, to make a joint analysis with them. Right? Um, just to, to reiterate where our three business uh, groups or user groups fit in into this picture. This is, of course, the, the, sorry, the marketing version of the slide. Um, and this is basically the whole um, data management scope that Time Extender covers for you. Um, we bring in data from 250 data sources, right? So no more manual coding of data sources um, on how to ingest the data. Uh, among these 250, you will have generic stuff like REST APIs, JSON files, Parquet files, XML, and, and all of that stuff, but also uh, very specific connections for certain applications that you use. Like, I want to connect to Salesforce, I want to connect to Jira, I want to connect to Navision, um, so where your business data actually lives. So we bring these connectors. And then we have the three stages, the operational data exchange, the modern data warehouse, and the semantic model. And Morris will be mostly interested in looking at raw data from the lake, but he will also need, let's say, curated data from the warehouse, like customer master data or something like that. And then we have uh, Ren, who's taking care of the whole chain um, to get the data moving. And then, of course, we have the business users who are mostly interested in this part over here, use everywhere, but that's not their only uh, focus. So this brings us to what we will actually do. So part one, as I said, is we will curate the data. Um, let's say in our company, we are based in the US and we have already a financial dashboard in Power BI running. And in there, we have our sales um, over, the, over the months that we are already looking at. And we also have a breakdown by, let's say, product models over here. Now, I'm the data engineer, and I get a call. We acquired a new company. They are based in Europe. Please onboard their ERP system to the data lake, um, consolidate the new ERP system into the existing infrastructure, add all of this to the existing dashboard. But also, please load exchange rates from the API because we now need to cover multiple currencies. Uh, this is actually a live web API um, giving us XML data. And then also, please create a new measure that we will call cross-line total in euros, and it should be available in euros. Now, if I think back to my days in consulting, if, I, if I'm tasked with something like that, besides the fact that I was working as a part of an army of let's say 20 engineers or something. Um, if we were to do something like this, uh, this requirement will take, I don't know, at least days, if not even weeks uh, to complete and to go through the whole process. 
but today, as I said, uh, I'm pretty sure we can do it in uh, less than an hour. But we won't stop there because once we've done all of that, the data is available and it's ready to use. And we can not only have it available in the dashboard, but we will also make a part two uh, of today's session. How can we use Apache Spark to really read and connect to raw and curated data that we have created today along the way? Um, how can we connect and read, um, join them together, and then perform an analysis on both of them? All right, that's enough for the slides for now. So let's jump over to Power BI. And um, here you can see the dashboard, basically the one that we have seen on the slide. Uh, and we have here one source company, and that is called AW 2019. And we have an analysis of our sales figures um, across the months on top of here. And over here, we have a breakdown um, of product models. And then we also have like a table visual down here. Everybody who's familiar with Power BI, this is uh, what you do in here. So now we want to go uh, attack our task uh, and get the other company onboarded here as well. So since we are using Time Extender and this will give you a low code uh, environment and a very straightforward way of doing all of this, the first step I need to do is to uh, create connectivity. Connectivity to the source systems um, is being handled in the Time Extender portal. So I will just jump over here and you can already see data sources that are being configured in here. So the data that we've seen at the moment is Company Data USA. Um, my friends in IT have already configured for me Company Data EU. So this will be the second company that we are using. But more importantly, you can see over here the provider names. And the provider names show you that all the, uh, the variety of connection connectivity options that we have. So in this case, we're using SQL Server data sources. But on top of here, we also have Business Central or Microsoft Navision data source. We can use Azure Data Factory to ingest data. We can connect to CSV data. We can connect to REST interfaces. Um, we can connect to Excel. Excel is your friend, always uh, remember that. Uh, we will use this data source as well, exchange rates, which is a REST API, and it will spit out XML data. Uh, actually, we can have a look at it. So this is what this data source looks like, and we will connect to it. Um, and we have a whole bunch uh, more. You can see I have a Jira application connected, Parquet files can be connected, existing data lakes can be connected. So there's a whole uh, list of connection options in here. If you want to add a new one, just click on the add data source and then you get the whole list of all the 250. Uh, I think it's even more, it's close, closer to 300 or something like that. That is all um, I need to do in here. So basically you can think of what do you do in the portal is configuring connection strings, basically. The next step, is to jump over to the Time Extender desktop client. And that looks pretty much like what we've seen um, on the slide before. So you have also the three layers in here. On the left, you have the ODX, the Operational Data Exchange, and it has configured some of the data sources that we've seen in the portal already. In the middle, we have the MDW, Modern Data Warehouse. So this is our SQL database. Oh, sorry, and the ODX in, over here is representing basically a view on a Azure Data Lake storage container. And on the right side, we have our semantic model, the data mart, the data product um, with the different endpoints uh, where you can use the same model in different front end technologies if you like. Um, on the left hand side, we have the Solution Explorer who ties it all together. And you can see I have a lot of uh, things set up because obviously I um, try to build out different use cases and different scenarios just to show the bandwidth of what you can actually do in here. 
Um, so I, I didn't count it out, but I think we will be covering something like 10 to maybe 15 technologies, different technologies that would, you would need um, different skill sets, maybe even different people for, but we will do all of this uh, within this uh, one single window. Um, and the only time we will jump out and see and look at something else is when I want to highlight and show you what is actually happening in the background, but you wouldn't need to leave this window to cover uh, any of the topics for today. So, okay, then let's go ahead and add some data sources. Just a right click over here. Let's call the new company AW2022. So this will be our European company. And then I can just select from the connection strings that have already been configured in the portal. So I will connect the company data EU over here. Now I'm already connected live to the database. Uh, in this case, it's a SQL database. So I can just get everything or a subset of the tables that I want. So let's say I want just these. Then we can also see that I can be very particular about which tables I want to read, but I can go one level further down as well um, in terms of PII or, or stuff like that, um, data governance. I can also remove certain columns that I don't want. I can even get a preview already. Let's say I don't want the address for some reason and maybe the spatial location I don't need. Then I would just remove them and just load six of the nine columns of this table. You can also be like me and just be a data messy and just transfer all of the tables. And I will create a so-called transfer task because like the, the overall thinking in Time Extender is do as many things as you can in just metadata because moving data can be expensive. So we want to avoid it uh, whenever we don't need to. And so until I have created and executed a transfer task. Nothing has happened, but uh, only just some metadata has been moved. So let's create a transfer task. And now typically, if you connect to an ERP system, you don't want to load the whole thing every night. Let's say there's billions of transactions in there and millions every day or something like that in a real world scenario. You don't want to extract every night in a full load uh, fashion all of the data, but instead you would want to go for an incremental load. So that would mean every night I get only the things out that are new or that have been updated. So now it depends, of course, um, which, uh, which columns you can use depending on your data source and how you would go about it. In this case, I know the source has a modified date column in all the tables. And I also can use uh, the subtract from value feature to make sure, let's say if there were transactions that have not been finished during the last load to load them again now, or that have been updated or something like that. So like a sliding window of 24 hours, I always want to extract those. We can also take care of updates and primary key deletes um, in here. And while this is just three clicks away from you using time extender, if you were to code all of this out, it will take you a long, long, time. We also try to make many things as efficient as possible on, on big data sources. So we do have a lot of these rule-based approaches. So I just put in a table name or something and based on the metadata that we know, it will be applied to the actual data source structure. And that gives us um, these results down here. That's all I need for a incremental extraction. So let's just execute this data source. And while we are doing this, Let's connect another one that I will call exchange rates. And that will be our XML web API that we've seen before. Let's select this connection string here. And again, I can connect to it live. Um, and this is now a live connection to the XML. It's parsed in real time with no further configuration on top of it. Um, and if you try to do this by hand, this is again where you spend a whole lot of time before you are able to write live SQL against an XML API. Uh, and here it's, well, 
just a few clicks away. So also here I will take all the tables, there's just one. I will also create a transfer task and the beauty is once you are connected in this way, all data sources, all structured structures, it doesn't matter where they are coming from, um, they all look the same for me within Time Extender. Now let's say from a web API, I don't necessarily receive primary keys. That is an important concept, of course, in data warehousing and in database databases in general. So if I don't get them from the web API, I can also just uh, go in here and configure them. And let's say we have seen um, the exchange rate table will be identified uniquely by these three columns. And then basically we want to build up later on a history of the actual rates. Um, so this is not part of our database key, but these three columns will make up the key. So I can just configure them like this. Again, this will result in a rule-based approach on top of here. And then we are done with the exchange rate. So let's execute this as well. The other task has already finished meanwhile. So now we can maybe jump over to the lake because we already now have raw data in our data lake. So this is the Azure portal and this is the storage container that is connected to my ODX instance in that case. And now you can also see like in which way it is set up. You have one folder by default one folder for each data source. And now we have already the first company in here, AW2019. If I refresh now, obviously we get the new data source AW2022 and we also get the exchange rates. Let's uh, maybe have a closer look in there. What does it look inside? You get one folder for each of the tables. Within each table, you get one folder that is timestamped for each extraction, for each full load of the table. And then in here, you get some information on the metadata and under data, you will find the actual data stored in parquet files, highly compressed, columnar format, um, type, uh, type aware, data type aware, and all of the good stuff uh, that goes along with it. So within just a couple of minutes, you can build a data lake um, that is fully compliant to all the best practices that go along uh, as per Microsoft, et cetera, on how to do it. And, and you you don't need to like put much effort into it. So we have configured incremental load. Obviously, um, 000 is the full load now that we have extracted now. Um, if we execute the transfer task tomorrow again, it will add another file in here with just the new stuff except when it detects a schema drift, so change in the schema of the data source. Um, if you want that, you can of course also disable that, but by default, it will check for a schema drift. If a schema drift is detected, you will get a new full load automatically once, and it will fall back again to incremental loading after that. So there's a whole lot of um, automation going on, making your lives easier. All right, then, back to the time extender interface. So we already have covered uh, two of the requirements. So the next one will be, how do we get this into our data warehouse? So over here, I have my data warehouse that is co covering like 20 tables or something. A real live data warehouse uh, would maybe have hundreds and hundreds of tables. So in, it becomes confusing very quickly. In order to focus, to make it easier to navigate and everything, we have perspectives over here configured. I have a sales perspective that will focus solely on these tables that are relevant for our um, sales model in Power BI. So I just activate perspective and you can see, okay, I don't need to take care of 20 tables, but just these two, four, six tables over here. Okay, what what does a table look like, or what does it mean um, a table to be to have a table here in Time Extender? Well, it looks very much uh, familiar from a database perspective. You have columns um, with a name, obviously, with a data type, 
that you can see, but we also have a mapping, like where does this table feed from? And also we have system fields, which covers all of the housekeeping needs in your data warehouse and time extender builds and maintains all of these for you automatically. We have a surrogate keys, we have batch numbers, we have source code for lineage information, we have timestamps, et cetera. Okay, now we want to get new data in the existing table because right now we have just one mapping in here, AW2019. So we need to get from the new data source, AW2022 data in. And we are looking at the product tables today. And here we go. So the first is the product model table. And now to get a new table or a new source mapped into an existing table, I only need to drag and drop it. We are crossing um, technology borders uh, for the second time now, just by the way. Sorry, that was the wrong place to drop the table. We'll drop it over here. And it will give you options on how you want to map the new table into the existing table. I will go with Smart Synchronize and it will tell me, okay, we have a second mapping now. Table itself has two mappings. All columns have two mappings but the catalog description has just one mapping. So most of it went automatically. And I just need to correct the one column that wasn't mapped automatically. Let's do the same maybe for product category. And let's do the same for product subcategory. And let's also look at the product table, the, the product dimension that has a few, couple more columns. Again, let's smart synchronize this one. And you will see again, now I get the warning or the, the message over here that the mapping is not even. And we try to make it even easier for you to, to avoid mistakes in here. So you can see the stop sign, you can't drop the columns where the data types are not compatible. So this is of course not a, not a, a check um, on the content. Does it make sense to, to map it here? But at least it is a technical check to avoid technical mistakes. So making sure that you only map um, compatible data types. And now if you imagine we are, not, um, we are not consolidating two data sources, but maybe 12, 50, 100, if you do, um, if you do enterprise level uh, consolidation, international consolidation of your numbers, and let's say you have uh, 50 entities across the world uh, with each their own ERP system or something like that, then you wouldn't want to drag in 50 times the same table, but you want to take it one step further. And again, we have also for the mapping, uh, a rule-based approach, we call it a mapping set. And in this case, you don't need to do anything, but just synchronize the rule set that you already have, new table found that will match your request or your mapping set, your rule set and map it in and you're done. And we will do for the, we'll do the same for the sales order detail, evaluate the, the mapping set again. And now we have two mappings in here as well. All right, so far we have only looked at existing data, but we also need um, our exchange rates in here. So how complicated is it to set up a new table? Well, it's exactly the same. Take a new table, drop it on the tables, and you have your new table in here with the names, with the primary keys inferred from the data lake, um, with the data types, everything set up around housekeeping, and the mapping is also in here. So that is super cool already. That was pretty easy. Next thing, we want to make sure that we build a history of exchange rates. Again, uh, this is uh, going to the in, the in the direction of slowly changing dimensions and topics like this. How do you build history? How do you make sure to have the right, um, to always have the right exchange rates and, and stuff like that. For point in time analysis, for as is analysis, this is where you want to have something like that. And you can build this again by hand, but it will take a whole lot of time and it will be very error prone. 
we have coded this out uh, for you, so you don't you don't have to. You just click on the table settings, enable the history, make some additional choices if you want to. Then you go to the data extraction, and of course, a historized table we can't truncate every time, so I disable that, and now the table is historized with a small h. Now I need to configure what exactly do I want to historize within the table and how do I want to historize it because there's different strategies, type zero, one, two, three, et cetera. So I just click the history settings. I select my natural keys or they are even pre-populated from the primary key of the table. And I will just say, build a history for the exchange rates, please, type two. And if you look what's happening in the background now, if I open up the history settings, you will see what is actually going on. We're building surrogate hash keys for type one and type two uh, columns. We will create from and to timestamps. We will create a is current flag and all of that stuff. So that was pretty cool. Now I have my table available. Let's join it over to our fact table. To create a relationship, again, I just drag and drop the two columns that are related. I want to create a relationship and now it's persisted in my model as well. And now we want to make a calculation in the fact table with the new, uh, with the new exchange rates. So let's drag them over here and it will pick up that we already have a relationship. And since the dimension table is historized but the fact table is not, it will ask like what view on the exchange rates do you want to denormalize to your fact table? And in this case, I want to have the historical correct exchange rate based on the order date. It will then also ask me if I want to do some performance optimization, that is always nice. And then I have my rate and it will be joined based on the currency code, of course, but it will also make sure that the from and to valid dates um, are between um, uh, around the order date. Okay, but maybe I also want to sometimes have another view on the data. So I uh, denormalize it a second time. And in this case, I want to use the current values of the exchange rates. All right, that is good. Now I have these two. So let's build our figure now, our new measure. Now I create a new field. Let's call this gross line total in Euro. And we go with a numeric data type for that one. And let's add a field transformation. Time extender, well, we say we do low code. We don't do no code because it makes sense to have the flexibility and the power of code and the whole feature set of the underlying technology available at your fingertips when you need it. Uh, and this is why I now add a custom transformation where I can add custom SQL code in here to make my business rules uh, apply. In this case, we will take the order quantity, multiply it with the unit price, and we will multiply it as well with the exchange rate. And while I have done that, you have maybe noticed down here, the parameters popped up and they will give you the lineage information. So where does your data come from? How is it being transformed? And where does it end up? Uh, what's the impact if I change something, et cetera, et cetera. So all the dependencies, the, all the metadata magic is down here in the parameters. And of course, this is a very simple example, but even in the real world with hundreds of tables with a lot of code maybe in there, you still have that lineage information with the uh, through the parameters. So you always know where's the data coming from and how is it being transformed. And that of course is super powerful because now I have this formula and this is where the data engineer typically gets ready because now I'm being asked, okay, rate is not a very good naming. This is not our naming convention. Please change the name. And then, okay, this is, uh, sorry, this is the exchange rate euro and this is the historical one as per the order date. So now I make this change as, um, as per our naming convention, but I have all these formulas spread out throughout my, my tables, et cetera. And you don't know, this will certainly break some pipeline. 
if you do it in a metadata driven way, it doesn't because you have the parameters and they will adjust all the formulas, all the code throughout your whole project. Um, if you make a change, but and the metadata will rescue you. Okay, let's maybe also rename that one and say this is exchange rate euro as as is. And this table is maybe called not data but exchange rates. And all of this will now populate throughout all of your dependency trees. So that's nice. Until now, we have only changed metadata. We have not destroyed the database. The dashboard is still working. We have not created invalid data or anything because we have only modified metadata. But now is the point to deploy and execute our changes. Um, I will go here with the defaults. We do have a version history of what your data warehouse looked like, and we have version nodes as well. So I will add a nice comment that where Yuri knows what's going on next time. And now all the code is being generated, but only for the, the artifacts that have been changed. And since we know all about the dependencies, we can also execute now in an orchestrated way based on the new dependency tree. Right, so now it's it's spinning up here and I configured in this case like eight um, simultaneous threads. And we will always try, or time extender will always try for you on each run to optimize um, in such a way that it will try to do as many things at the same time as possible as your resources permit, but also making sure that all the dependencies are met um, so that nothing gets lost. While we are waiting for this transfer to finish, we can look what's going on um, in the background. In this case, we are using um, Azure Data Factory to load from the data lake to the data warehouse, uh, which is uh, Azure SQL. So let's jump over again to the browser. This is my um, Azure Data Factory. You can see some previous runs, but if I refresh now, we'll see active uh, pipeline runs. And if I go into, into any of those, you can see, okay, this one has already finished now. But of course, we generate pipelines, we generate um, the linked data sets and all of the stuff that is required. Uh, and it will integrate seamless into your data factory as well. Um, but you don't need to create the pipelines, you don't need to worry about them. And um, we are also over time optimizing the way the pipelines work. So by just continuing to use time extender over time, your estate will become, your data estate will become more and more efficient um, because you just deploy the latest version and we take care of the optimization and coding in the background. So now that is done and you can now really see like in which orchestration the dependency tree has resulted. So this is how it's being resolved this time. We will log execution times and data source behavior over time as well. And uh, it actually feeds machine learning models in the background and they will be used to um, optimize the orchestration on each run. Okay, that's cool. Now, how do we get the new uh, measure into our semantic model, into our dashboard? Let's have a look at that. That also looks very familiar um, for everybody who has worked uh, with a tabular model or a semantic model before. So you have also like tables, dimension tables, and here we have a fact table uh, with some measures in there, some relationships. And here again, it's the next technology, but I can just drag and drop it across, take our new measure, cross line total in euros, and I can say this is the order quantity times the unit price in euro, I want it to be a currency. And I want it to be summarized by default. And that's basically all you need. Um, and we have already made the changes to our semantic model. 
Now, depending on which front-end tool I would use, I can um, deploy and execute uh, the different front-end um, tools that I need. In this case, we go with Power BI Premium. Again, deploy and execute. The semantic layer is also um, version, version controlled. And you can also, for that, always go back in time. Let's say cross line total edit. And I will now send out under the hood an XMLA command to deploy the new model to publish it. And then it will trigger a data set refresh um, on the data set. And with that, we can jump back to our um, dashboard over here, click on refresh, and now we can see we have the second data source in here, uh, AW2022, uh, and everything is where it's supposed to be. And also we have created the new measure cross line total in Euro. So let's just drag that across here. And you can see with the exchange rates from today, the new data is being um, calculated and um, updated here in our chart. So that is super cool. And maybe before we uh, jump over to, to the Spark side, let's have one more look at what that means uh, in terms of the metadata layer, because I've been talking about that a lot. And I think it's a super great tooling for the data engineering side because it adds so much transparency. Like, why why did I end up with that number? Where does it come from? How does it calculate, et cetera, et cetera? And we have all that information because we did all of these things in the single UI and we've built out the metadata uh, layer on top. So I can, on everywhere in my project, just right click and get the data lineage for a particular for a particular field. And based, of, based on all the things that you have done in the project, you will get the dependency graph for this particular column or for this particular measure. And you can do it backwards or forwards, or you can start in the middle. And in this case, it takes us from the Power BI measure or column in the Power BI table to the data warehouse. It will take us to our own um, transformation in custom code, and it will take us all the way back. Um, to the data sources in here. And I think that's uh, super powerful. And since you have that, obviously you can also just create a documentation from that information. And that will give you a fully linked PDF file that is always up to date um, with all the tables in here. Our new table is already there. And let's jump to the sales order detail, to the fact table maybe. We can see even our new um, newly calculated column is in here, cross line total. And it even goes down to the level of the formulas. So that was, uh, that was the first part um, of the demo. So we took now raw data to curated data with a lot of explanations uh, in well under let's say 45 minutes. So, but now we have the data in the lake and we have the data in the database. Now, how can we bring them bring them together? And that's where I think uh, uh, Spark, for example, is a super cool technology that gives you the flexibility. And now I set up a workspace uh, in my environment here. And obviously, I'm super grateful now because Ren has done all the data engineering, right? And I have just my trusted sources to connect to. So I don't need to worry about putting too much pressure on the source system or having, um, well, not, not, not very clean master data or something like that. I just go to my two places, the data lake uh, and the data warehouse, and I consume all the stuff from there. Obviously, uh, never store your secrets in your code. In this case, I set up a data Azure key vault for that to store all of the secrets. And first we want to connect to the curated data, so to the um, modern data warehouse. Um, I have set up a small cluster over here with, uh, with some Databricks runtime environment. 
and the cluster is up and running. And obviously I have prepared some code here as well. So in this case, um, the MDW is a SQL database, Azure SQL in this case. So I need to specify that particular driver and I will get the host name and also the database name from my Azure Key Vault. And I will do the same for my SQL user and SQL password. And from all of that, I will just combine it into a, a connection string. So let's just execute that one. I think cluster is just waking up. Okay, here we go. Now, now we are connected or have the information uh, ready on how we want to connect to it. Um, and then what we do is, in, in this case, we're using PySpark. So we are using um, Spark commands within Python, within the Python language. And in this case, uh, I can address the Spark functionality by using spark.read, in this case from JDBC, so from a um, relational database with the driver that we specified above and with the connection string we specified above. And the customer dimension has the name in the schema MDW customer. So I just plug in the table name in here and put in username and password and then load the data. And then I can display it because Spark is actually lazy uh, in the best uh, sense. So it will not read the data until I actually do something with it, either perform a calculation to write it out to some file or present it here on screen or something. So only if I really um, do something with the data, it will be read from the actual destination. So let's ex execute this cell here as well. And now we are looking at the curated data in our data warehouse that we've just created, right? So here you see some housekeeping columns and then all of the columns um, that are in there created from the data source, but also the stuff that has been added by time extender, like the lineage information, wh what came in, in which batch, what's the source code, what's the timestamp, et cetera. So now we have the customers. Let's do the same for the table, uh, for the product dimension that we just created. Execute that table. And again, now we have, we can see down here the product dimension table data. So that is all good. Now we have the master data that we need for our analysis because we want to analyze sales uh, across the products, but also across uh, geographical regions. That, that was the question that we got. But I don't want to do, I, I want to use the master data for that, but I also want to use the raw data, it's the latest and greatest data that we have in the data lake, because let's say um, the, the transactional data in the data warehouse is refreshed just once a day. Um, and that is just not up to date enough. I need it with the latest data from today because there was an incident this morning or something like that. So now we need to connect to the data lake as well. And uh, I put in all the links um, in the notebook and we can share that with you, obviously. Um, and all of this, this code has been taken uh, and put together from the documentation. So you need to set certain parameters. Again, we get some secret uh, values from our key vault. And then we set some configuration values that really tell Spark how to connect to our Azure data lake. And we put together down here as well, like a connection string and plug in all the options that we need. And the end result of that will be that the data lake to our Spark engine looks just like a local temp folder or something. And we will have that available under, under this folder, uh, MNT OD, ODX ADLS, uh, with all the secrets that we have. Prepared, let's just mount it. Okay, already exists, so that's perfect. And now we, can, we are connected and we can actually look at what is in our data lake. So let's look at AW 2019 sales, sales order header. All right. And so 
as, as I told you, for each full load of the table, you will get one additional folder in the data lake. So now, of course, we need to identify which one is the latest one and read the data from that one. Of course, now I can hard code that, but it, that doesn't make much sense uh, because that's not very operational later on. So I need to, to get some code to find always the latest version from one particular folder. Um, and in there is a subfolder data, like we've seen before in the, in the structure in our storage container. And if I just execute this code, which will do this filtering down for me, um, it will tell me that the latest version is the one from today uh, in the early, early morning time. OK, so I need some logic to, to filter out. How can I get the latest version from my data lake of the tables that Time Extender has created for me? And now I can make this reusable by defining it in a function. And now we can actually read the sales order header. Again, with spark.read, in this case, we want to read parquet files. Um, using our function, which determines the latest version, uh, and this is the path to the table in the lake. Again, we will display the data. And in this case, the Spark cluster is doing the heavy lifting, not the database anymore. So it depends, uh, the performance now depends on which size did you give to your Spark cluster. And we can see it looks very much similar to what we've read from the data warehouse, obviously. We have sales order details, order date, due date, ship date, etc. A lot of information and also um, the modified date over here. Very cool. Now let's also read the sales order details, which is actually our facts by just pointing it to the other base folder. And that gives us the sales order details uh, like you would expect, the product IDs, et cetera, et cetera. And so now I have access to both the data frames that are based on the curated data from the warehouse, but I have also access to the data frames that are based on the raw data from the data lake with the latest data. And now I can perform in PySpark also join operations like you can in SQL, um, just with a different syntax. So I start from the fact table, and then I join on the header information, then I join on the customer information, then I join on the product information based on these tables, sorry, columns. Then I do a select a subset of the columns down here, um, some descriptive ones and some actual facts. But I can also on the fly create new columns like combine region and territory, combine category and subcategory. And I can also calculate new measures here on the fly, like the cross line total, for example, um, using the order quantity times the unit price, just like we've done before. So let's execute this one as well. All right, and again, we display out the data and we get the order quantity, the unit price, et cetera. So all the columns that we've selected, but also the ones that we've added on top, the region territory combination, category, subcategory, and also the calculated cross line total. And then, you know, if I want to now persist this table to do further analysis on it, um, without writing it back to the data warehouse or something or going back to REN, I can just write out this table and have it available, let's say, as my analysis, um, like a shortcut, and then clean it up later, for example. All right, super cool. That also worked. And now, obviously, uh, Moss wants to. Um, well, get back on what he was asked for. Um, and for that, he wrote some more fancy code. And as, as you know, you can now sky's the limit. Um, you can perform all the tasks visualization wise that you want to do, um, or in terms of experiments or whatever, and make them operational and not just uh, a one off. 
uh, thing. So in this case, again, I put together some code to, to get some visuals out here because uh, Power BI is not so good in, um, in XY charts, in the cluster charts. So I used instead um, Spark uh, to give me these charts and to see, let's say, how the gross line total is influenced by the order count and how does it spread out uh, across our categories. And okay, no, no big surprise here. In our portfolio, the bikes themselves are the big ticket items. So they are here and, and generate the big gross line totals even at lower order count numbers, whereas the components um, are of lower value and so they are more here on the left side. Of course, I can also switch the angle now from an analysis perspective. And this again now depends on how fast your browser is. So uh, wherever your compute is, in this case, it's the browser. Um, and it will take some time to render this more complicated chart. Or maybe it doesn't render at all. All right. Instead of waiting here for the render to finish, I think the, the point is clear. You, you got my point. Um, and that to, to finish that up, let's uh, recap what we did. Let's say, looking back at our three user groups, the business users are happy because they have their dashboards available. But also, if they make a request for some ad hoc analysis, they will receive it in a timely fashion. Makes them happy. The data engineers, they are as happy as they get because everybody else is happy. And that is actually, well, one big uh, source of stress for the data engineers. There's a lot of requests coming in. They need to keep infrastructure running um, while still getting new features out or new data in. Etc. So they are happy because they can fulfill all the requirements that they are asked for. And the data scientists are happy because they get access to all the data that they want and need without too much prep work um, over and over because there's a much cleaner split be between what the data engineer can do in a timely fashion and what a data scientist, uh, what, what is actually his, his task and area of expertise. Dave, what do you think? Uh, I think that took us way farther in 60 minutes than just from raw to curated in 90. Man, made it look easy, Frank. <laughs> I'm clearly dealing with professionals from, from Time Extender. So, mate, great fun. Absolutely loved it. And um, if you're watching along at home, drop, drop us a little message in the chat. Actually, I always love to see a little thumbs up, a little thank you, a little clap emoji, something like that. Let us know it was worthwhile. And um, really, really good. Um, I could see uh, uh, Wayudi typing away in the Q&A uh, as well, which is good. So maybe Wayudi, if you want to come back uh, and jump in and uh, let everyone see your uh, beautiful face again. Um, I'll maybe get you to stop sharing your screen, actually, right, um, and, and people will see us a little bit bigger. Um, I've got a few questions that just jumped out to me as we were watching along. Um, we, we won't stick around for the full half hour, I don't think. Obviously, it's kind of lunch hour in the UK. People will be perhaps jumping back to meetings and stuff like that. So we'll judge it. We'll see how it's going. And um, if you do have any further questions extra to the seven uh, that Wayudi's already covered, please do stick them in the Q&A and, and we'll pick them up. Um, I guess just from, from my perspective, um, it, it, you, you did make it look very easy. Um, it was clearly very, very quick, very valuable, um, jumping straight in, pulling data from all these different sources. Um, in terms of the architecture um, side of things, are you able to decide, you know, what architecture you want to use? You know, what, what flexibility is there within, within the tool? Yeah, thanks, Dave. I, I think that's, that's a really, really good question. Um, and I notice uh, on myself, like, you don't think about it too much anymore because 
you go doing it this way really abstracts away from the technology. I know what's running underneath because obviously I need to show it, um, but it really abstracts away to a, to a certain degree. So the beauty is you really have some flexibility on each of the layers that we've been looking at. So, and, and to let me just preface that with, you can do this fully on-prem if you still want to. You can build out a hybrid scenario uh, and you can build a full cloud scenario like mm -hmm. we've seen today. Um, and on, e on each of these layers, you have some flexibility. So for the staging layer, you can go, let's say more traditional with a staging database, a relational database, or you can go with the data lake like we've seen before. I would highly recommend that, but mm -hmm. if let's say there's no cloud strategy in your company yet, you're still able to get started. Yeah. Um, on the data warehouse, you can go very traditional for SQL Server on-prem. You can do Azure SQL like we've seen before. You can go with Synapse if you want to scale out like mm -hmm. uh, SQL dedicated pools. And uh, the latest addition to the crowd is um, Snowflake. So you now mm -hmm. also have that option. Yeah. And we're working on on more, amazing, more amazing. platforms to come. Yeah. Grow, growing all the time. Lo love to exactly. hear it, man. Th thank you very much. And um, just before I jump to my next question, there, um, I will you know call out a few of these because it's always nice to know people have been uh, watching along. So first of all, Jacqueline Harron, uh, thank you. Valentina. Uh, thank you so much. Frank is a great speaker. We we know this already, Valentina. Uh, Eleonora, clapping emoji. It's steady. It's my favourite emoji if you're at a presentation. So you've had a round of applause personally just for you from Eleonora. Uh, thank Rob you. Newman, uh, really interesting. Thank you. Um, Dan Tidar, uh, he's gone clapping emoji with a smiling face, mixing it up. Uh, Francesco, thanks, Frank. Uh, Siddhartha, thanks. Excellent walkthrough. Mary A, uh, great presentation. Um, there's more and more there, so I will jump back into that in a second. But just in the meantime, um, you, I think you, you kind of touched a little bit on it in the presentation, but in terms of connecting in other you know, data science tools and applications, um, it might be quite nice to expand on that, actually, and, and you know, tell us a bit more uh, what that looks like with Time Extender. Right. Um, so, so I think... And, and I hope I, I, I try to make this very clear. So Time Extender is a tool to, to enable you to move on the technologies that you decide to use 10 times faster. But mm -hmm. we will not like black box you in or anything. What we have created today is um, openly accessible data on your data lake. We have created mm -hmm. SQL code that is accessible on your data warehouse. We have created Power BI data sets that are in your tenant. Right, so all the things that you create, well, they end up within your environment. It's it's yours, um, and so I figured out how to connect it with Databricks today or Spark, uh, and and of course you can use all the other tools that you that you want would want to use that are able to connect to an Azure Data Lake. I assume that's all of them, uh, and you can use all the tools that are able to connect to a SQL database. Amazing. Again, probably all of them. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. That sounds awesome. And again, sounds very, you know, straightforward. Get, get, get shit done. Probably shouldn't say it like that, but uh, yeah, it's all about getting stuff delivered. So uh, absolutely awesome. Um, in get terms to talk of to our CEO. That's that's his quote. Oh, is <laughs> Just it? get shit done. Honestly, that's the way. It's the it's the future, man. It's the future. Um, jumping back into the comments, uh, Kirsten Murray, uh, thank you. Clapping emoji. Ian Boyd. Ian's gone with a straightforward thumbs up. I like that. Straight to the point from Ian. Uh, Martin Blakely, thanks, guys. Stephanie Boyd, thanks, Frank. Uh, Veronica, thank you. Really interesting. Laura, thanks so much. Uh, Carmen, thank you for the great presentation. Um, Adam Steeds jumped in with a question, which is also in the Q&A. So that will take me back to the question. So Adam is asking about uh, pricing. Um, is there a free or a trial version of Time Extender? Can you tell us a bit more about pricing and you know starting to use the product? Absolutely. So, so um, I think just just recently, just beginning of the year, we launched um, our free version, and I think that's absolutely amazing because we can just get out um, our way of how to do it, of how we think it should be done, um, out to in the hands of more people, and you can just get started for free. Obviously, there are some limitations that apply, mm -hmm. but uh, nothing will stop you from from just getting started. Just download it, create your your license, and and you can just start with it for free. Um, otherwise, if you're looking into the paid options, um, basically you pay what you use, 
Um, so there's no limitations on data sources or anything or the amount okay. of data that you move. So how many data lakes do you want to automate? How many data warehouses do you want to automate? Yeah. How many semantic models do you want to automate? And just the, the number of them, that's all we charge. Amazing, amazing. Um, I guess carrying on with that, actually, um, you may or may not know this um, information. Uh, obviously, uh, Frank's here talking tech with us. But in terms of time extender, you know, customers you work with, you know, I guess use cases where it's gone very, very well. You know, if you've got any examples, a bit more context about time extender as a business and, and who you work with. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, the, is there a specific industry or something that we work with? No. Because I think we, we all know um, data is now everywhere and all the companies are like looking at ways of how to get it done. Um, we are in the market since uh, 2006. Uh, so this is no like beta version toy or something. Uh, we have three and a half thousand customers around the world mm -hmm. uh, who are using the product. And so I think we have success stories in all the industries. Um, now, if you ask me where, where is it most successful or where, where is the adoption um, the best, let's say, we always think of small data teams with big mm -hmm. data dreams, right? If you just need, need to get shit done, but don't have an army of, of consultants yeah. and developers. Sometimes if, if we walk into an enterprise and we showcase in a, in, in a big enterprise and we showcase what we have, they say, yeah, that's too easy, that's too cheap. That's not working. That that's not yeah. complex enough. Uh, I I don't get it because it will just get things done. Yeah, amazing, man. I, I'm a little bit like David Brent from the office when <laughs> when I'm in with my team. I love a saying: "Small data teams, big data dreams." I'm I'm stealing it. I'm, I'm literally do. scribbling it down on a piece of paper as we speak, man. So that that will be getting rolled out in the in the com coming weeks. Um, back into the comments, uh, Teo, thank you. Uh, Karen Scott, thanks for this talk. Lots to think about. Uh, thank you, Frank. You made it uh, very easy. I will 100% second that. Uh, R. Donnelly, thank you very much. Uh, Valentina, uh, get shit done. That's my language. You, you're in the right place, Valentina. Uh, Louise Cook, uh, thank you. Great talk. And then finally from Faraz, thank you so much uh, for a wonderful session. So I think um, that is you know, kind of us drawing things to a close there. there there's no more comments in the chat or um, uh, questions there. And um, I just kind of want to give a, a shout out to uh, to the whole team for, for making this happen. Uh, while well, has been frantically typing away in the background there, um, nine nine questions answered. H how did you find it, Wayudi? You seem to have seamlessly dealt with it all. Was it a smooth process? It uh, it went uh, very smooth. The the questions were were top. So uh, yeah, that's fantastic. The uh, interaction with everybody. So Amazing. great. It's, it seems to be very relevant questions as well, didn't it? Very knowledgeable users we've had uh, come and join us today, which was nice to see. Yes, I got that same feeling. So amazing, amazing great stuff. audience, amazing stuff. Uh, and yourself, Frank. I always like to ask, you know, how, how did you find it presenting at the Data Science Festival? I, I liked it a lot. Uh, I think it was uh, amazing teamwork beforehand in the organization uh, running up. Um, I think we had a great interactivity today. Um, Big time. I, I like it when there are questions coming and uh, if you know if we give give people something to think about, that's uh, what I love the most. I think we've we've definitely done that today. And I think the thing we're looking forward to at the Data Science Festival, obviously, you know, this is the first session, but um, you know, as mentioned, you will be joining us in person events as well. Um, so I don't know who will be coming from Time Extender, but if it's either of you, it'd be obviously great to meet you in person. And I do also have to give a shout out to Sarah in the background for, for pulling it all together uh, and then obviously from the festival side we've we've had Jess and Philly uh, working very hard so it's been re really really enjoyable and um, I guess in terms of just wrapping things up um, it's been great learning more about Time Extender uh, I'm, I personally have learned a lot and I hope everyone at, at home has um, and just really appreciative actually because um, obviously it's not just the time that you've given up today to come and share with the community is preparing the data, it's preparing the session uh, and all that sort of good stuff as well. So thank you so much. It's been a fantastic session. I hope everyone at home uh, has enjoyed it as well. And uh, I look forward to seeing everyone very soon. So thank you all very much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.
Thank you, Dave. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.